This podcast is made possible with support from Radio Engineering. Radio is the home of reamping, and the latest additions to the reamp family help streamline your studio setup and expand your creative options even further. Bring your full collection of amps and effects into play using any pre recorded track and experiment with new sounds at your leisure. Whether you're new to the reamp process or a seasoned studio engineer, Radio has a tool to help you easily incorporate reamping into your workflow. Learn more at radioeng.com. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. New York City duo Beacon has been releasing haunting down-tempo electronic pop since their beautiful 2013 release, Ways We Separate. Jeff Stanfield caught up with Thomas Malarney and Jacob Gossett to chat about their beginnings, record-making process, and their new album, Along the Lethe. Enjoy! Good morning. Hey, how's it going? How's it going, man? Well, uh, thanks for your time today, guys. Um, yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm here with Thomas Malarney and Jacob Gossett from Beacon. I, I'd love to chat about your new record today, uh, along the Lethe. Yeah. But before we do that, I'd I'd love to just do a little background and and talk about how you guys kind of came together and started making music as Beacon. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Um, so Tom and I met uh, at a school called Pratt in New York, um, 2004, six, six. Yeah. Uh, lo- <laughs> many years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Um, yeah, we we're both studying, um, art at the time. Um, I was studying painting and, and video and Tom was studying sculpture. Um, yeah, kind of like met first week of classes and, uh, you know, kind of formed a collaborative relationship, um, in other areas, you know, outside of music, like through art, you know, art school stuff. And then, uh, yeah, towards the end of those four years was when we like, uh, probably the last year of school, really, we started kind of uh, writing music together, perform, mostly performing, really, um, kind of grew out of like, we were making these like, performance video pieces around the city. And then we started playing in like all the, the Brooklyn venues at the time, you know, kind of weekly. Um, yeah, not really recording quite yet, but mostly like performative stuff. Um, yeah, it just kind of evolved from there. Um, Tom, you can probably add to the, the background yeah. I, story. I mean, we so that was like 2009 in Brooklyn, and it was pretty. I mean, we we kind of blossomed out of that scene, which was really rich um, at, at the time with all these DIY venues, and and pretty much like Jake said, it was like every weekend we were playing, um, but it had extended from pretty directly from our art practice. Like we saw it somewhere between performance art and music at that point still and even at that time like the visuals were still a huge you know we were we were carrying around the projector to every venue that we went to and like that was just always a super critical part of it so that remains to this day but yeah it's like for us as a band it's it's something that very much grew out of our art practice i would say yeah, it's interesting, right? Like, uh, well, it brings to mind uh, Scott Hansen from Tycho, who is so, you know, involved with all his visual art and how he ties that into the music. And and I think coming from a from an art background, you were talking about painting and sculpture. <clears throat> how, how do you see that sort of playing into what you guys do musically? Right, right. I mean, you know, I always kind of thought I was going to be in the visual arts, really, like, you know, for most of my early early years. Um, but then, you know, starting to work on this project with Tom and, you know, Beacon really became this, like, place where, like, all the things I w- was interested, I think, you know, goes the same for Tom, could really kind of exist under, you know, like, it's led to directing videos for the band and making animations for live visuals and lighting design. You know, it's kind of really expanded to just all these essentially like aesthetics that we were really interested in. And, you know, as far as Tycho goes, I mean, the, you know, funny story there is like, you know, I was actually in grad school, um, my first year of grad school after after Pratt, and we were working on our first EP, and we actually had gotten an offer to go on tour with Scott and for, with Tycho, and 
remember there was a moment where I had, I had like a, an art history class or something I had to go to and I got there and I was like, okay, I can either do this or I can go back to the studio and finish this work on this record and then, you know, go on tour. It was definitely like a decisive moment. Like, okay, I think I'm going to leave this, this program, leave the studies and, uh, and kind of like really jump in here. And that was like a pretty definitive moment for me personally, where I was like, okay, this is, this is the route we're going to go. And like, you know, Beacon can be this much larger thing, even outside of music. You know, I could do a lot of things, which is, um, you know, to this day, it's really, it's been great just to like explore all those, those ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Beacon really turned into this like container of all of our disciplines and interests at that pivotal moment that Jake is talking about. And we could kind of pour all of our creativity into it. And you d- you did drop out of that graduate program, but not without us like co-opting your studio space yeah. <laughs> beforehand yeah. to like write our first EP. So, right. I mean, we were like, we were writing a lot of the early music in like empty classrooms and you know yeah. like uh, student studios in in art programs. So yeah, I yeah. went to I went to Hunter um, for grad school and they have they had this great studio uh, building for all the grad students and the summer like no one was really there so we basically just like I was like let's just use this for the rest of the summer we can work on, we can work on the record here which is what we did. It's great. Which is good. In prep for for doing this interview, I was poking around looking for some some interviews to see sort of what you guys did live and stuff. And what really struck me was just how much space there is in the music. And th- and this was really made evident by s- some of the phrasing lyrically. You, you sing a phrase, and then there's just all, all this space <laughs> for everything else yeah, to happen. Yeah, yeah. And it struck me because there's a, there looked like there was a lot of standing around. <laughs> you know, you're <laughs> sort of like you do you you have a phrase, and then you kind of sit back and let let the stuff kind of happen around you. I, I love that you're not in a hurry, and and I think that that's often an overlooked virtue. Is that something that that uh, you know it, it kind of plays back into this? theme of like the painting and the and the and the art piece is that you know the 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 frame and the space around the music you know Mm. right i mean you know there's certainly i think an inherent like in in the most like generic sense like uh, the the idea of composition and which like it's like a pretty early thing you address as a as someone studying art, you know, visually, and I, you know, I think for from a writing perspective for music, I mean, <laughs> it's a, it's a lot of like we put a lot of stuff in, in the beginning. It's like it's pretty like we're adding things, we're adding, and then it's like there's a long process of pulling stuff out, making space. You know, it's all it's often built around you know the vocals as well. So it's like okay, how we make how do we make the most space for the vocals? How do we make them? You know, really the, the focal point or like shine in these moments, and usually it's like a process of removal. You know, so the tracks go through lots of iterations. Um, you know, sometimes too many, probably. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think that's probably a good, a good frame for what you're talking about. Um, I know yeah. you probably have some. Yeah, I feel like I mean, reverb and space is not an effect to us. It's like, uh, it's an instrument itself, really. Like, and like Jake's saying, to as far as composition we frame things around the vocal and the space that it can linger in. Obviously my vocals are pretty wet, but that is, that, that varies. Like, I mean, it might seem broadly that that they're just wet generally, but like that's very much something that is, is tied into the rest of the composition and fits. And it's like, you know, going back to what, what was the, like one of the first reverbs that we used was the Cubase's, um, Roomworks. Roomworks, yeah. Roomworks had this hold button on it. And like, so basically, you know, I mean, which is pretty common in, in reverb effects in general, but it's like, it was sort of this thing that clicked where it's like, you could throw something into a space, throw, throw something into a space and then keep it there. And then as it's there, you can, you know, you could start side chaining it. You can start manipulating in some ways, but it's there. It's caught like you've caught something. And I think, to a lesser extent, like the the time, how much reverb we apply to something, and that idea is always there where the space, the, the separate zone that a lot of time, I mean, a lot of our instruments kind of occupy that space as well, but it's this like, this ether that the vocals can kind of sit in. And because of the palette, the palette of the vocal, you know, so much of our, our writing comes from sounds, 
right? Like comes from some interesting sound that we found that then we're building something around and the vocals that I'm tracking initially are, are kind of, you know, really common, but they're, they're gibberish. They're really just about sounds as well. And all of the, the timing of them, the cadence, like all, everything that relates the rhythm, it's going to come sort of, it always comes first as a sound, right? Like it's relevance to the music and what the song is going to become. So, um, yeah. I, <laughs> and also like, our our arsenal of reverbs is like probably the thing that we're always like all right let's get another one let's let's <laughs> let's try that one it's like and um yeah it's just it's really important to uh, us creating music are those um uh plug-in reverbs or hardware reverbs both uh, both both yeah um you know some some ones that i think are you know probably pretty common you know like a, the valhalla is like a big one in the mix um yeah. You know, we have a Eventide um, space pedal. I have this old, like, Digi uh, Boss. Yeah, was it the Digi, Digi the Verb Digi Boss pedal? Which RV5. I, which is, like, one of the first pedals I bought, like, 25 years ago yeah, right. for, like, my guitar. Um, that is, like, pretty prominent even to, to this day in the live show. Like, I run the, the Prophet through it. Um, it's, like, the main reverb for that for that synth. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we definitely we're always kind of collecting and you know, both hardware and software. I'm looking at the RV5 now, and it's like, so this, you bought this as a guitar pedal originally. Yeah, it was a guitar pedal. But it is a stereo. Um, it is a stereo reverb pedal. So it's like, you know, when we first got the Prophet, now 10 years ago, throwing this pedal on it allowed it, like, because we were really, uh, when we first got the Prophet, we were just like, we were really, really new, intimidated by yeah, it. New you to could, these, this level of analog. Yeah, and the sounds see, were felt dry. <laughs> like you're like, so it was like, okay, how do we make this Intense. obviously iconic instrument fit? Which is now it's like it's all over Beacon stuff. But yeah, when Jake threw that pedal on, it was like, oh, okay, now it's Beacon. Like now, yeah. now we can. It's got like, this, now like, we can work with it. It's got like a modulate knob yeah. or something. It's like a kind of chorusy reverb. It's really, really yeah. amazing. Really shimmery. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, I, 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 and I agree that, you know, you, you take instruments and then people filtering them through, you know, things that appeal to them sonically really ends up creating, I mean, there's a, there's a fixed set of tools, right? And I mean, there's, there's so many, so <laughs> many, there's a ton of people that have profits or, or chord right. minologues or, or whatever it is. And it's sort of like, how do you, how do you use those tools and filter them through your own uh, voice? And one of those things that really sort of helps define that are effects. And I think that that's like a huge, huge part of people's sounds and, and how they're, you know, creating an individual vibe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's and true. I certainly feel that with you guys. I mean, I, I, I think that the, the reverbs are a huge part of your sound and, and interesting. And to me, I've always thought about it as like those spaces when you talked about throwing something into the void and then, I feel like that's that's like a reflection pool, right? It's like this time for reflection, and and I think that's what's so nice about the space in your music is that, you know, you, you have a line, and then you can sort of meditate, or the listener has a moment to reflect upon that in the in the in the space, whether that's your intention or not, or it just sounds cool. Um, that's how I perceive it, and so I think it's it's a it's a very effective um, tool. You, you guys mentioned Cubase. Is that your primary DAW or uh, was that just where you started out? 
it, it, yeah, it is. It's our. It's been our DAW from day one. Um, for the, for this project at least. Yeah, we use uh, Ableton for our live show, but we write everything in Cubase. It's definitely the, you know, it's the first DAW I ever used. Um, just kind of love it, and you know, it's like I guess you just you pick one, or I mean, I think I got in because Tom was using it at the time. Tom was like already using it, so I was like, all right, well, I'll try this one, and you know, sure enough, it's it stuck, and yeah, it's. I mean, we love it. It's. Uh, it's definitely not the most common, I'd say, at this point. But you know, it's well, what are the things that you? Is it because of the familiarity of it, or have you and have you used other DAWs uh, and come back to this, or is it just what you know and what you've used? Um, yeah, we we definitely stuck with it, and we I think we've like built a certain skill set within it that you know we've been able to keep refining and building on over the years, and. You know, it's it's also the DAW's gotten better and better as well. They've added features, and you know, even to this day, I'm like finding new things. You know, it's it's almost like an instrument for me now, where like, you know, the DAW itself. There's so many things within it that I I use as writing specific writing tools. You know, like it has all these inserts and MIDI and uh, you know arpeggiators that are really really great to use, which I'm sure all DAWs do. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's I see no reason to change really at this point. You know, I feel like it's a good. It's still challenging to use. Yeah, it still it still surprises us for sure. I also would say, like in those early days, I I got us into Cubase because I was originally using Reason, and right. Cubase was the way. You know, if you bought one of these Steinberg, I forgot the brand, but it was like my first sound card, and was a way you needed Cubase and Rewire as a way to get Reason in. So then, but you know, this this other thing about Cubase, which initially was really grabbed, I think both of us, is that it's very linear. It's very like left to right, which both of us have like, and and had at the time, a lot of experience editing video. And right. we're like very hands-on in that. And it's, it's I mean, more so than other, uh, obviously Reason and, and Ableton, like you can get that out of both, but more so the second you open Cubase and, and Logic as well, it's more of that logic. It's more of that that way of like, just thinking, like reading. That's a great point. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm like super involved in video software, you know, Premiere and After Effects and all that. So like that was already like second nature to me pretty much. So then, yeah, the, like it didn't take long to kind of, okay, this is how this functions. You know, yeah. it's, it's on all, it's not that dissimilar. And the other thing with Cubase is like in those early days, we were only using native, um, the native effects, the native like MIDI effects, which even back 10 years ago were, were really sophisticated. And we got by, like, I mean, most of that whole first record, it like Roomworks, all that, that reverb that sort of grabbed you, that's all Roomworks, you know? Um, and the Retrolog is obviously like still to this day, like um, the Retrolog is all over the new record as well. So yeah, those, those native, um, those native instruments and effects that, that Steinberg has built are really powerful too. So yeah, that's why we've stuck with it. Hey, you guys are producing and recording your records uh, in your own spaces. Um, is, and based on our conversations, I'm guessing you sort of learned along the way. Yeah, it's oh, been, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been a big learning curve. I mean, you know, from both the recording process to the space itself. I mean, we're, you know, we're in our studio right now, which is now we moved in here, um, you know, during the pandemic, essentially. Um, but it's been like a slow progression to like, Get to this point where the studio is almost fully self-sufficient like you know it used to be like we had to go record vocals somewhere else and then the next record we go oh we can do vocals because we got the good mic and the good pre and or whatever and then you know we had to go cut piano somewhere now we have this piano and you know it's like this long evolution of like how can we get to this point where like we can do everything in house essentially um which is kind of where we're at now and then with that, like learning how to record, learning how like techniques and all that, and how to use compressors better, how to use whatever it is, has kind of grown alongside of that. Yeah, it's it kind of comes back to like what I was saying that our our band grew out of an art practice. So, so I mean, yeah, like in those early days, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, we had no computer on stage. Like very, you know, critically, like everything was sample based. Nothing, yeah. you know, it was like all just <laughs> very live and intense. Like. You know, at that at that time, Suicide and Underworld were like our main influences. And I, I actually still use the vocal pedal um, that I used from back then, which allows my voice to just totally linger um, with a delay in that case. Um, but the whole thing was just very live and intense. But there was not 
a ton of like interest at the time in some of this stuff that like later on um, was just the d- discovery of like the band and all in expanding our tools, like Jake said, expanding the studio to now be self- to be sufficient and feel like we can achieve everything that we want to achieve uh, ourselves because our sound has changed and expanded too. I mean, you know, even like the from the first record to where we're at now, um, we've expanded so much sonically. So, you know, it's been it's definitely been a learning curve. Um, both both aesthetically of how to make that stuff fit with what we do and also just technically how to make it sound like uh, you know how it how it should sound and fit with our uh, with our music yeah it's always it's always such a fruitful time too when you're adding new equipment and gear and things you don't really understand you know like once you kind of kind of really unpack something an instrument or you know a plug and you kind of get to these default modes where you're like oh I want to do this thing I know how to do it like, let me go do it. And that's, like, a pretty big trap, I think. So I think over the years, like, you, know, you obviously need to know how to do certain techniques and things that you want to achieve the work. But, like, the most exciting stuff definitely, I think, always comes out of, like, I don't really know how this works. <laughs> let me just, like, turn some turn some knobs. Let me, like, yeah. let me figure this thing out. And, like, along the way, as you start to, like, understand it more, like, you find some really unique things that you probably wouldn't had you already known a lot about about the gear. The value of having a studio space that has <clears throat> a bunch of stuff in it, you know, instruments and everything sort of set up and you can sort of turn, turn around and look at a thing and be like, oh, maybe that or, you know, you have these different these different flavors. It's like, a, you know, cooking in a well-stocked kitchen or something, right? Like, you know, you got the a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and your point about like not really knowing how to use something and, um, you know, that goes back to like. It always makes me think of the stories I heard about Miles Davis, you know, and like Keith Jarrett and Chick Corea and that sort of bitches brew era band where, you know, these guys played grand pianos, but then he, you know, gave them like a, you know, 51 key, what was considered to, by them to be a toy mm-hmm. and said, go play this, you know, a little electronic piano, electric yeah. piano or whatever. And yet it forced, it forced some creativity there that, that they w- normally would not totally. have um and you hear you hear it you know it's nuts you know you hear like the you know mutron and all this nutty stuff happening and you could tell they're just they're just exploring it and and your records early have a lot of like you know the drum machines and stuff are real they well they they're drum machines right you, you have like a real tight you know drum machine kick kind of thing but i th- believe it's on this new record there's a there's a track that starts out with the kick drum and it's clearly, it sounds like a, like you're just recording a kick in the room. Um, but that's been integrated into the sound with the other electronics and, and, and things. Uh, but it feels like a, even something as simple as that feels like an expansion of your sound while staying, you know, somewhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, we, I feel like we progressed into a space, um, with the last record in particular, where there was a lot more acoustic instruments, you know, there was acoustic guitars and, you know, live drums and, you know, piano became a big feature, which has continued, continued into this record. Um, you know, I do feel like we circled back a little more into like the electronic space on this record, but, but yeah, like you're saying, like, it's just, you know, with every project, with every song, you know, you're just always trying to find something new. It's like kind of where the exciting stuff happens. And it's like so important to writing, you know, that you're just, you don't really get kind of stuck in a loop of stuff you know. Yeah, I think um, I think the song Ostrich from this record captures, like, is just kind of, I mean, if I had, like, if anything was going to represent this stage of our career as musicians, I'm like, I feel like that. It's, it's it, that song, and it's interesting because that song has so much to do with space, too. It's such a, it's such like a, um, it's an extension or it's like a progression of what of how we've been using space but taken to the limit because a lot of that was us tuning the instruments to the ostrich tuning and then just letting the mics go and just recording the space and then playing them back i mean it's that that track is like probably 50 tracks at this point yeah. you know and it's like well and also cuz Colin Stetson joins in on that track and we got from him like 12 you know, 12 sounds. takes pretty much. So <laughs> right. they, that whole track, that whole like song is just filled filled with space. And different and the, spaces. And too, different spaces of, here, yeah. our old studio, and right. a lot of them are all 100% wet. 
So it's like really clangy and long and there's just a lot of noise and like the diversity of sound on that, like what, so we have the piano, obviously we have, we have Colin's like range of saxophones, um, the guitars, all the guitars are tuned to ostrich and then we have your son. Yeah, I I have a four year old son and I stole all, I bought him this little kit of like shakers and bells and I I stole from his room and brought it to the studio and so all the bells are on, uh, like all the kind of like bell, sleigh bell kind of sounds on that track are from from those. Like, you know, we set up some contact mics and we're, you know, recording in the, around the space and they're just kind of like really amorphous and like off time and just meandering. And it's just like, you know, just works really well with the whole song is kind of like just flowing. You know, there's no, right. nothing's really locked into anything. Yeah. Well, you, you said something that I need to go back to. You said you, you tuned all the instruments to the ostrich tuning. Right. Um, so that was t- like, you know, it's historically, I think Lou Reed is the first person to really, I mean, be, and it's named after the, a song from his catalog where he tuned all of the instruments, uh, all of the strings on one instrument on the guitar to the same note. And that's where this very sort of like signature drone came from. And I was looking up ha- sort of Velvet Underground production techniques and stumbled across that. And then, like, just we just set up the instruments in our studio that 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 day. Like, let's just see what happened. And so much of it is just like there. You just it's just, it was just the the sort of the process of us like tinkering with this sound, which immediately like once you tune it and once you do one um, one yeah. strum, you're like, okay, there there it is. You know, it's it's a signature sound. But like the whole song, you know, like even when Colin came on to it. He's like, is there a BPM for this? We we're like, not, no, <laughs> like, there's not. Whatever you want. You know, like the thing that you could go off of was the profit. Like, you know, at one point Jake jumped on the profit and was just using it, using basically the the VCA all the way up and the noise and then always like LFO. Oh, uh, the LFOs. Bounce, it's bounce like you just follow follow the rhythm of that like that random LFO. And I mean, he obviously he captured it perfectly. Like, yeah. but it was us sort of realizing that the whole thing was so amorphous. And a lot of it came from that ostrich tuning and the droning, you know, signature of it. Yeah, I mean that's a good segue to talk about some of the other tracks on this on this record. Um, uh, how about "Pay My Debts"? 
Don't you yeah. Know? Pay, um, so, I, you know, Pay My Debts came out of... I, I, like, when I think about Pay My Debts, I think that it existed, like the initial eight bars of it was all we had, and it was sat on the desktop. Our desktops are absolute messes completely, but it sat on the desktop for a while as we were working on the record. And then I think in the process of cleaning the desktop... I just hit the space bar and it like brought up the audio preview of it and the immediacy of it was like, oh, this is good. This is like, and it had been months since we heard it like, oh, this actually, this captured something, you know, that's sonically a little different from the rest of the record, but it's definitely worth um, diving into. So I think that is how I would categorize that, that track, you know. It was definitely a later one, you know. Yeah. It came, it kind of came later in the, you know, the whole record was recorded you know, basically a little bit before the pandemic, but most of it, like at the height, you know, uh, both, you know, in different spaces, eventually in the studio and, and towards the end. But, um, but yeah, it was definitely a later track that came along and yeah, it did, it did kind of like stick out a little bit, like in terms of how it sat with the rest of the, of the songs. I mean, it, I feel like it follows a certain like tradition of songs that end up falling on records, like tr- tracks like Marion or even this one off thing we did, um, in between records called feel something. Um, but it has like a little bit of that spirit, which always kind of lingers like in the, the band's like writing history. I think, I think also a cool part of this track is that, um, the main synth sound, which goes throughout is a retro log sound called nightmare shiver. And I believe it's one of these sounds that Jake and I working Secrets. separately. <laughs> oh yeah. Now, now people can, uh, can grab, this can grab that. You can, you can blank that out or not, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those sounds that Jake and I mean, there's like that sound back bank is like hundreds of songs, but working separately, we both like brought in demos with that sound. So it was kind of this like interesting moment of like how clearly, I mean, yeah, like how much our sonic sort of, I don't, you know, how much our ear was tuned to each other in a way and to like this thing that is Beacon was like really something that, that but we both could land on so separately too and then come together so yeah that that sound is used elsewhere on the record yeah. and it's definitely like and there's also there's other than the core or other within the parts where the 808s come in that sound is doing all the work yes. and that, like literally like that like you know because we're doing it for live now and realizing that jake is playing it like across three octaves pretty much yeah so like the, all the bit, like it's filling up so much of that frequency range to drive the song. Obviously, the sound has a ton of character. It's got bite, you know. It's got that sort of de- detuned screaminess yeah, to it like in the chorus. Yep. The sun moves inside my head. I pay my debts. I pay my debts. If I'm about uh i'm the answer another one i just i really dig so that that track that's one of the ones that like uh was like right around like right around the pandemic i think it's the last thing the last demo i made before um like complete lockdown and i i think i left it on the the uh, the de- our old studio in brooklyn i left it like on the open or something around the desktop told tom to, to check it out and it was like a few weeks later i'd left town for a couple, you know, a couple, like a month or so. Um, but I remember him hitting me up and he's like, Oh, I love this track. This is really, this, this idea is really cool. 
Um, and then he had like kind of take, taken it and you know, moved some things around and put some vocals to it as like a little bit of a demo. Um, but yeah, it's like definitely one of the older tracks. Uh, if you know, felt pretty immediate. I think it has like that immediacy to it as well, similar to the to pay my debts. And yeah, I mean, it kind of that one lingered around for you know two years, and you know, eventually when we got back together in the studio, um, kind of built it out. But it was a lot of like the bones for it were kind of done in that initial that initial demo, which is like profit a profit base and like a really simple like kick and you know. These these kind of tracks always really kind of work live too. I think you know we're we're gonna work on the live show now and you know this that one and there's a couple other ones that just definitely like these are these are great tracks for like playing live because they're just they're kind of they're simple they're kind of straightforward and they like kind of hit immediately. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's one that like when I when I came in and heard that like the B and the bass. I sort of got into a range zone and then put that vocal on top. And that's like to go back to the, the, the ways we separate, like that is a long vocal. That is like one phrase that hangs out for, you know, a while before the next one comes in. And like, yeah, I think it works that way because it's, it's reduced. It's, it's simplified to that, that effect and to that, that ability for that vocal to just really hang over, over the space. How about one more? Um, uh, the track Mile a Minute has uh, Matthew Deere on it. And this one, the first time I heard it, it reminded me of Boards of Canada. Yeah. Tell me about that track. Um, yeah. So that so that one, that one definitely was demo, definitely originated um, right in the middle of like peak pandemic era. Uh, I, I had been staying up in the Poconos with some friends and um, I've been running a lot of demos up there actually. And, you know, Tom and I were sending stuff back and forth. Obviously, we couldn't work in the studio. Um, and like a lot of the tracks on the record, like they're it's just like this little, you know, eight, 16 bar loop. And, you know, one of the one of the key like production things in that song, which happens on a couple of tracks, was this whole like th thing I got into up with this. Uh, gating kind of gating sound sending signal to like synths that were then gating so you have these kind of like lush synth sounds which are also incredibly rhythmic because they're being kind of gated through you know a, uh, you know hi-hat sound or something like that so like that it was like a big feature on the record that it didn't it didn't always make it through the final tracks but that one definitely retained it it's like the initial sound that comes in um, and then yeah we just like we were developing that song Tom, Tom had initially done that spoken word thing himself and like in that track, I, I don't think that that bridge existed. And when I put it in in my regular, um, the regular octave for my voice, you know, it just, it didn't feel like it moved you into this alternate dimension like it needed to. So then I pinched, pitched it down and it really felt like that sonically, you know, like the, the space had been filled in a way that was interesting and dynamic against the rest of the track. So uh yeah and then it was like well we could keep me in or uh, obviously matt matt's voice is so perfect for that his regular register um so he hit him up and yeah he was he was really down to jump in but that whole section is about kind of like 
you know, breaking through to uh, some like a different sonic space for a second. And obviously, to bring this is our first time we've ever brought in another vocalist on our music. I mean, Matthew Deere was hugely inspirational for us when we were getting started, when we initially connected with Ghostly, and like the big full circle moment to have him on the music, but also just sonically, it works so well. Like, it, it really, like, you know, the the quality of his voice and the register, it, it just, yeah. it takes you to that part. Um, but I guess you're also like talking about the- um, The sample. The samples at the end. Yeah. Which I, um, well, I mean like they're just, let's, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, they are- It can remain a mystery. It can remain a mystery. They're, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah. a mystery. I mean, let's just say like we, you know, it very grabbed, again, another thing that just grabbed us immediately um like and felt something very disembodied about it all which is yeah. i don't know yeah. it's felt very uncanny yeah Baby. Hello, baby. Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapeop.com, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time. I love you.